how do I want to say this? We're going to have a lot of green on the map because it is overrun with forest now, but that's going to be obvious. So what I want to do is focus in this in this part now on what's what's the general map and what is the approach going to be? For purposes of D&D &D and story uh, and storytelling, this is going to be a conceptual look at the dungeon. We're not necessarily going to be balancing encounters and placing um, a specific trap, or if so, we're not going to calculate the DCs. I'm not worried about the mechanics of the game just yet. I want to make sure that we can present something that is... Um, we can present something that is workable. Um, something like a, a, a canvas itself, a canvas upon a canvas... Uh, upon which we can then paint. And so I want to talk about the concepts. I want to talk about, so this area is for this. And if we want to tell a bit of a story, then there's this. Now, um, there are a couple resources I'll point you to. And you know what? We might end up hitting those checklists. I'm not going to uh, go strictly by them like I did the last time we built a dungeon as sort of a, um, a, ooh, pardon me, a mental exercise. What I do want to share in concept is what's called the five room dungeon and a dungeon checklist of the things that every uh, every dungeon should have i would urge you bookmark those sites and re refer back to them if you're ever going to make a dungeon now are we going to you know again are, are we going to go down this checklist uh, uh you know specifically uh, probably not is it going to have all the elements i hope so but it's still going to be our dungeon that we're going to design. Uh, and then w we can see, well, maybe there's something we can do to address this. So I'm bringing these up uh, for you to consider. But we're not going to be riding on those rails for this dungeon. They don't lurk. I'm taking them through the Horde of the Dragon Queen, and they make their way through a dragon hatchery this week. Oh, my. Of course, this week's bills kill my bank account. Well, Astraeus, the um, uh, the raffle is free to enter. You don't have to you you don't have to purchase anything for it. All right, so we know there's a temple. Am I concerned about, you know, gargoyles or like what, you know, does the outside, you know, have pools of blood and bubbling eyeballs and all this other stuff? Uh, not, not yet. Not yet. So there's going to be a, at some point in time there, oop, that's not what I wanted. There is a main temple complex. Now surrounding that in some in some capacity is Oop, not that an area that would be maybe outlying temple buildings. Uh it could be walls, it could be um you know, it's not like the main worship center like where the boss room or whatever. Um but there is going to be an area around it that is going to be support structures for our, our temple kind of little city-state area. And surrounding even that, um, we can... Mm, what would be another another good gray here? I guess we'll go purple. And surrounding even that is an area where, you know, like the, the families of the cultists or... You know, the farmers that supported the community, and of course the community was run by the cultists, or something along those lines. Um, th that's where that's where they are. And so you'll find ruined structures, probably not a lot left. A lot of them are probably, you know, wood or mud huts, uh, thatched roofing, stuff that was probably reclaimed by nature. And then, and then, at some point, we have a... A forest area.
and we we had some grassland in between. Now a civilization uh, needs. Oh, you know what we'll do? I'll make this. Uh... There we go. A civilization needs water, and a forest needs water as well. So maybe something uh, something we can do that uh, that could have been uh, been a point of contention or a bridge is let's have a lake exist here. And the lake had some rivers. Goes this way. Maybe there's mountains off to the side, uh, and so like it, it's being uh, these are these are feeding, and this is outgoing. In that case, there might be another. There we go. So the water's flowing out and past, and providing this area with fresh water to drink. Which is important for life, even if you're sacrificing others' lives. We can even do something like indicate uh, some little hills or, you know, it's like a little hilly area. There's, there might be foresty foothills, the water's flowing down from the, the, from the mountains and such, uh, collecting here. Uh, before continuing to flow down. So there we go. We have some hills. Open flatland. The things are being harvested here. And so here's our setup. In fact, we can even have the... Uh, from here, we can even decide where is it our heroes or our anti-heroes. Because uh, not a lot of them might be heroes in the in the classic sense. Oh, sorry. I, I got so caught up, I missed chat. With pools of milk and bubbling cups of tea, says Jedi. Oh, what happened, Luke? What happened? Um, I have... I have nor returned. <laughs> High fives a wiggling tentacle. Wait a minute, you have a tentacle too? Are you a flump or evil? Wow, <laughs> what a binary choice. <laughs> that's that's lewd, and then goes back to high five. <laughs> Jedi. Dang, Maddie, I was going to suggest using Wonder Draft for something, but you're quite the paint pro. Uh, well, we'll go back and make it pretty in Wonder Draft. I would like to do another Wonder Draft stream, but for quick concepts, paint is excellent. There's no reason not to just use paint and a mouse. You made me spill my ginger beer. And by spill, I mean like do a little spit take. <laughs> Flump. <laughs> um, so this is our before, okay? Uh, so the cultists were operating here. They would send, they'd send people like up the river or over land. And, and there's some sort of a society that's in the woods. It, it could be elves or it could even be gnomes. Gnomes are, don't have the mechanical fey origin, but gnomes are traditionally fey creatures, if that makes sense. Um, so maybe we can make a, a, a gnome community in here. Um, that's It's kind of like tucked in the foothills of a mountain that's off the map. And uh, we can say that uh, their territory was just off screen and is occupying uh, what would be a fun gnome shape. Um... We'll just go for a diamond. It's off screen, but it works. So the gnomes are living here. And uh, every month or every so often, um, cultists would uh, would travel and abduct poor little gnomes, you know, gnome, gnome babbies, 
no maids or even no men uh, to bring back to sacrifice to their demon. Um, and in exchange, the demon was uh, was making them powerful. Uh, you know, the, the fields uh, the fields were fertilized with the blood of gnomes. Um, it you know it made the flower industry just really just uh, spring up overnight. Anyway, that's a pun. Kind of a grizzly one, fluffy sheep. If you hear it, cover your ears, earmuffs, fluffy sheep. You shouldn't hear about what we're doing the gnomes here. Well, we're painting with a mouse. So, uh, g uh, back in Get Ye Flask times, even from our current Get Ye Flask times, um, a group of gnomes and maybe some elves or other, uh, you know, some other people said, no, we're going to put a stop to this. And now we can, we can kind of make a timeline. You know, now that we have this, we can visualize what's happening and tell a tale. When we do this as DMs, this makes us so much more comfortable to um, um, improvise or to fill in lore gaps that come up. And now what we're looking at is the forest has honestly just crept over everything. All the hill, like... Um, all this Archfey put uh, put his time and effort into uh, into growing uh, the forest out. So it's probably more like, um, ooh, pardon me, more like a like a tendril. Maybe it hasn't over it has it wasn't able to overtake. It tried something's going on. Like it just got a little bit, but there's there's a force. There's something here that's keeping the main. The main part. There we go. So there's a gnome community, and afterwards, the humans that weren't cultists, but, I mean, so I married a cultist, uh, and, and we're starting to produce these tiefling offspring, uh, they moved away somewhere. Um, it could be over to the mountains. It could be further south. It could be somewhere off the map. Um, but move they did. And... Let's say they moved out to the grasslands. Ma'am, what are you doing? Well, don't you meow at me. I guess that's all you can do. I can't be mad at you. So there we go. To, to represent... So we're using a hexagon for the old temple. And so we'll use the six-pointed star to reflect like that's the heritage. Um, and so we have the gnome civilization. In fact, the gnome civilization might have even grown. And so we have... Uh, just as we were using uh, a diamond for the old gnome homelands... Now, perhaps, uh, the, pe the people who came here to wage war on the humans who were worshipping this demon uh, made a secondary settlement themselves. And so now let's take, uh, let's see, that was pink. Uh, let's use a, uh, kind of this, this lavender color will work. And they are going to nestle, they're going to nestle themselves, uh, uh, right here. Kind of uh, on the border, right? On the border of the woods, along the way that the cultists would, would come to infiltrate the forest. And so we have kind of like a river town in uh, Lord of the Rings, or in uh, Hobbit, right? And this is made up of more than just gnomes. You know, these are the descendants of the people who came to, to uh, abolish at the behest of the Archfey. Uh, this this uh, area here. I'm a lore fiend. Well, that's just because uh, Mordecai is a uh, is a college of lore tiefling, right? <laughs> so now we have our past and our our past here here and and with our old boundaries and our present. That's uh, 
that's um, shown here where the forest is taken over. I mean, I could kind of like spray paint tool over this with a, with a green, but I think you get the idea. Now that we're in the present, we realize that a group of some kind has infiltrated the uh, the temple and is reawakening uh, what's happening. And as we have a botanist here with uh, Zavadoth, plenty of places to conduct botany in the, uh, in the field, in the hills, um, or in the forests themselves. And so in our timeline, someone came here, is kind of reactivating this, this worship. The demon or an aspect of the demon woke up and ended up uh, taking a stroll through the woods that it didn't remember that were there. Remember, this is all woods now, too. So Zavadoth could have been from this uh, from this area and is now uh, and was conducting research on, I don't know, some a, a rare little wildflower that has, you know, some medicinal, like low key medicinal purposes, only really gl uh, grows in the hills for whatever reason. And um, and this is where, you know, the demon was resummoned, left and slaughtered his people, except for him, left him. And and now the Archfey, who is kind of waking up now to, to mind his new territory, he hasn't had to in however many years, you know, 600, 1,000. You know, enough that elves are like, I don't remember that. That was a little while ago. Um, And so it, this is when Zavadoth would be tapped by the Archfey. Um, because now the Archfey's nemesis, um, you know, we, we have we have our our two competing powers. And you can also set up, if you're setting this up as a story or an adventure location, um, you, it can, you can even say as the DM, well, the force it has been, um, the force has been changing lately. Um, it seems to be dying slowly or the trees, um, the, the trees may not be dying, but they're, they're definitely taking on new shapes. They lose all their leaves, but they, they still seem to be alive or at least in a mock semblance of life. And so you can build the atmosphere, right? You know, mist, uh, just uh, mist clings to the uh, to the forest floor, even though by this time of day it should have burnt off uh, with the sun rays hitting everything else. You can build suspense, and you can prepare your players for what's to come, because that can be one aspect of dungeon building, uh, you know, to get your players prepped for what's going to happen. Now, I am going to, to uh, preempt this and say, in fact, I don't know if King... Uh, if King is still here, or if King is here and is listening, I think especially with a structure like this, we can get away with having a part of our temple or our dungeon be something that is just completely ridiculously overpowered. At at any level, it's you know it's it's not even like an optional boss. It's just a dragon has taken up residence in here over the years. You know, it fell asleep on a pile of gold. Uh, yeah. You know what? Uh, I, as, as the DM, I'm sending my adventures in at level five. Uh, so congrats, uh, congrats on that. But if they decide to go after the the, the dragon's treasure or whatever we want to put in there, then it's probably going to just lead to death um, because they, you know, did, did they get greedy? Could they fight against that? Was the, re you know, did they trust the DM to say, well, everything's got to be balanced? You know, th this is going to be an on rails dungeon. We just got to make the checks and we'll continue along the way. You can always throw in a curveball like that, where there's something that is just ridiculously overpowered that no one would expect in a dungeon like this. Knowing he's a botanist, maybe there are corrupted flowers and plants the closer to the... Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, just like how dragons affect the area around them, if you're having, uh, if you're having a demon, uh, you know, sort of recorporating, um, and uh, and with a vengeance, mind you. You're going to start having uh, people disappear in this town, let alone our gnome village. Um, you know, there's going to be murders. There's going to be people missing. So there's going to be now suspicion and there's going to be fear and all of this stuff, like not just the flesh and blood of gnomes or anyone else is going to feed this demon. The suspicion and the fear is going to feed the demon, which then in turn changes the flowers, you know, turns uh, turns the mist into clingy, almost a... Uh, Almost ooze-like. Um, it's going to turn the trees into undead 
uh, you know, things that try and just murder animals that pass by. So, like, you'll be walking down the road, and, and there's there's an old dead tree, except you'll see, like, a pile of wolves and birds and other things at its base. And, of course, the tree benefits, because the tree's just drinking the blood of the animals. Or as the animals rot and whatever, you know, the, the, the bio essence is going to soak into the ground. And maybe that's what this undead tree eats, if it doesn't just, like, shove a... You know, shove uh, some squirrels into its uh, mouth or whatever you'd want to call an approximation. And so you have, the, you can set a tone of horror or a, a tone of um, otherworldly supernatural phenomena uh, very clearly with this. So that's a great idea, Trestle Flumph. Um, so here's our region, right? Now, even with this, look, this is, this is just a dude with a mouse and, MN, and MS Paint. And I think we can describe what's going on here. I hope you're comfortable. Like, you know, challenge yourself. Can you, if you are here, knowing what you know, are you comfortable in the setting? Do you get an idea what's happening? You know, we don't need anything fancy for a, a, a starter map like this. Sounds like the demon tree idea. The roots not really moving, but over a few days quickly growing over the dead animals. Yeah, yep, and dragging them under. And you know what? The red herring could very well be this city down here. Right? Because, oh, those are the descendants of the demon worshippers. You know, that's where the tieflings live. So clearly, you know. And, and so the you could even try and send the party over here to investigate. And you know what's going to happen? You think the cultists up here uh, are, gonna, uh, not, uh, are going to not sacrifice people to bring back the demon? And so suddenly they learn... Wow, it's not just gnomes missing. Wow, it's not just elves and dwarves or, or whoever else uh, is on this frontier town. It's actually also these humans and tieflings uh, that are that are going missing. Or, you know, you're actually getting reports people are drug kicking and screaming through the night uh, to the north. Where they're never seen or heard from again. Or again, is a, if you really want to deliver it with uh, some panache. You know, these aren't just forest problems. All of a sudden now, the crops that are growing out in these fields, which have, which have been fertile, you know, yeah, sure. It, you know, years and years and years of demon sacrifice and wishing for, you know, fertile lands, that's probably going to linger for a little bit, maybe. And if it doesn't to you, well, this is my story. And so they are. And now you can imagine it too, because I put that thought in your brain. Anyway. So now even the fields out here are becoming blighted. Scarecrows are coming to life. Uh-oh, scarecrows. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, you know, the, the, the plants and animals are changing, or the animals are being driven off. Something is going on here. Now we can tell our we can tell our tale. By the way, probably something else that's happened. I'll draw this with a red line. If there is good relations, there is most likely going to be a road So there, there will be commerce, right? And in fact, we could even have the old... Kind of like in Curse of Strahd, there's the old Svalich Road. We could even have the old road. No one uses it. It's fallen into disrepair. It is, it is nigh untravelable. And I mean, so there would have been roads in the complex of going over here. Um, you know, th there might have been something at some point in time, an old road uh, that that started here and went north. But the forest ate it, so it's it's incomplete. And we can find little hints 
that maybe a road they took to get down to the gnomes existed here, but also the forest, the forest ate it, but the grasslands still show uh, wagon ruts. And so these tracks are actually outside of town. You have to look for them a little bit. And then you'll find... Uh-oh. And then, of course, there's probably other roads that lead elsewhere. I mean, from here, probably out to the mountains, if there's some dwarves living there. Or over to an elven, for a, a sylvan stronghold of some kind of the elves. You know, there's more that exists out here. But this is what I want to draw our eye to as a DM for our players. Officially ran into the best comment about my cat. Kitty is pointy in five out of, uh, out five out of the six ends. <laughs> That is a very interesting comment. Uh, so, we have adventure content. And we can refer back to this map uh, next week when we want to talk about an overarching adventure. But I want to make sure that we're going to zoom in on the dungeon and we're planning, uh, and, and we're planning for something along those lines. So let's... Uh Save as. By the way, I bought Drawful 2. Coffee Cat, I think you're the one who recommended that. Uh, thank you, and so we could play some Drawful together. Uh, we're going to call this uh, Dungeon Overworld. There we go. All right, so now... We're building a story, building a story, becoming more comfortable, uh, filling in details and the like. We know then for our dungeon, we are going to have this core. Uh, we're going to have this core area. In fact, we can even offset it if we want to focus more on that approach that that uh, that was on the other map. Then we had, you know, a, a bit of an otter area. Uh, that's not quite what I was looking for. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Say, 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 say. There's going to be the road that leads up. And there will be, if this is, so if these are outlying buildings, what we can do is, 
if we want to keep it as a uh, as a pentagram or a pentagram shape, uh, we can say that there are there are buildings that are in each of the corners. Do they have to contain five you know five keys for five doors? Maybe this is the big one. It's a gatehouse. Maybe we could just describe them as buildings. That's up to us. Uh, so what else would be in the periphery? Well, there probably used to be uh, some kind of a, a, a... There's probably like a lot of safeguards and walls and, and whatnot for the main, the core. Like where the demon itself is being summoned or was summoned and is being summoned again. Um, for what's happening here, you know, if the cultists are taking back over, there's probably some kind of a wall that uh, you could describe as being you know reinforced and rebuilt. Um, however... On the obvious approach that's happened, but where they're having trouble is, you know, if you're trying to build into a forest, that's more difficult to do, especially if the forest doesn't like you being there. And so you can describe that there's a wall around the outside of the front of the complex and see if your players catch to you know if you if you just purposely said front. You know, it looks like it's guarded, but here, you know, this is where trees are gr are growing like into and out of the the stoneworks. And it looks like they've been tried to to uh, you know, tried to cut some down or you know, tried to rebuild. It was just too difficult because uh, the the plant life has just grown in and through. And so they're just hoping that it's, it's just too much of a mess that people aren't going to want to go into the woods, especially because the woods are being corrupted by uh, the woods are being corrupted by this uh, this demon's presence. And so it's a lot easier to just take that easy road for straight up to the front door. But of course, now you're talking something about more like, a, you know, a four person siege of a cultist outpost instead of, you know, going on sneaking and taking that path less traveled, but it'll make for easier infiltration if you can survive. Officially ran in... Oh, okay, that was the best comment. Um, I guess besides the point, he says, Flump, uh, you finished the session? Got to get the second of three locations finished. Oh, well, yeah, hey, if, if you got to if you gotta get in some work, man, go ahead and do so. The work of the DM is never finished, says Tressa Flump. I, I believe you on that. Now, what we've inadvertently done through storytelling that is natural to this setting is one of the rules that's contained in the in the uh, the dungeon uh, checklist here, and that is different paths. Different paths allow different parties to experience the dungeon in different ways. Um, uh, it gives you player agency. It can act as a randomizer, and it allows parties to walk away from rooms they don't like. Do you not like this approach and you want to be sneaky sneak through? I mean, because look, we're designing this for the four player party. Yes, though, the personalities can change by the time they get here. They may have uh, a spell or an ability or just confidence in, in themselves as a player or as a player character where they want to take the, the haunted woods to get the, the easier ingress instead of taking the easier approach for, pro for probably a, a harder difficulty uh, trying to get in multiple paths. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have other buildings and, you know, so here there's farmers, there's probably like an old grain silo that was here. Uh, and of course, you know, the cultists themselves needed a place to stay. Uh, so that was probably back here. It's partially ruined itself, but there's probably like cult apartments that are over here. Um, and then, and if you're really in a pinch, draw shapes. Okay. I don't know what what this could be. Is it more important? Was it more apartments? Was this a huge cult? Uh, was this a, was that a warehouse? In fact, why do we have a triangle facing each side of the road? I don't know. I just drew it. It seemed cool. So now we can ask ourselves that question. This is part of the dungeon, still, right? So why would there be two triangles facing the road? Are they scanners? Is it like in? Are they like those uh, those sphinxes in? Um, uh, are they like those sphinxes in uh, the never-ending story that could just zap people passing by? Um, 
you know, if these are kind of apartments that are ruined because they've been grown into by the woods, is this more? And is this one newer? So it's maybe like built, it's built uh, more quickly out of modern materials instead of the old solid stuff that's over here. And then when you do that, even if it's just random shapes, come back and show, all right, so there's a road network, right? If this is like the little, the, the inner cloister of the, of the compounds. You know, you're going to need to go from place to place. You're going to have to get to these corner guardhouses if that's what they are. You know, if you've been on a college campus recently, you'll know that there's all kinds of weird paths that don't have to make sense, but they've been trodden on the college green so long that that's just the path people take. And in fact, you can even say a lot too, if this is the only road that approaches the inner sanctum, despite a network of other, of other roads going to other buildings, why is this the only one? What is it you're not saying that's actually indicating uh, an important detail? Is it because of traps? Is it honestly, uh, you know, is it honestly just uh, the deci an aesthetic decision they made as uh, as practical cultists? Could it have been the DM flub? You see, so you have a lot of you have a, a lot of clever cover pieces to dangle in front of your players and see if they if they snap at it. So if you have one that may be paranoid and say, "Look at this." There's roads everywhere, except except to the inner cloister. There's only one road. Why is there only one road? I, is it a code? Is there a symbol in the streets? You're sitting back there and you're like, I just drew this because I thought it looked cool. But you know what? If your players are like, yeah, look, it, it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like there's a big smiley face, and then there's like, uh, two eyes and nostrils. That's what the triangle things are. This is like a, 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 a weird skull, and you say, oh, you know what? Because your players are getting into it, right? You want to feed it. Yeah, you know what? It kind of, if you drew two horns coming off the corners up here, this kind of looks like, this kind of looks like the shape of, of a demon's face. You know, with its, its nose here and its cheeks here and its two horns coming up the top. And your players are, yeah. Yeah, we figured it out, and so this is the way in. Like, we have to go in through the mouth and go straight to the brain, because this is where the brain is. And you're sitting back as a DM going, yeah, uh, that's exactly where the brain... <laughs> Good job. Not in a patronizing fashion, but your players will surprise you, and you'll surprise yourself if you do stuff like this. I certainly didn't have this planned. I don't have another document open... Uh, that I'm trying to fudge my way through and present it like, <laughs> I, you know, I sp believe me, I was doing a lot of other things this evening than sitting down and pre-planning a dungeon. Especially when this, when unleashing this creativity is all a part of the process. All right, so, you know, we, we have this and uh, the, the brown area. Oh, nice coffee. Hey, are, are we going to see our blue boy up on, uh, up on our Discord? Huh? Huh? Uh, so you come out this way and you say, all right, so this is where, you know, the the village was, you know, so maybe maybe the cult members were all, you know, whatever. They're all men. They're all women. They were whatever, um, you know, based on socioeconomic structure. They were just randomly chosen with a birthmark. These are details you can weave in by evidence that's left behind. But we know for sure that the cultists lived in the in the light gray and the demon and, like, the higher-up cultists lived in the dark ray. Out here, this is kind of the farming village, kind of, you know, the market was out this way. The, you know, this is where the common folks who, yeah, they, they were probably a, a part of the worship, because if not, then they'd be sacrificed themselves. Um, but you can leave so much evidence here. And you know what? If you have an archaeologist and an anthropologist in your party, all the more, this is all the more stuff that they can get into. And it's, and the haunted one can get on can get in on this, and you know who also who also can. The urban bounty hunter, who's used to going block by block, and kicking in doors and looking in attics, and uh, and you know making making these sort of checks, to you know looking for evidence of signs of living or, or that, and so all four characters now. Can get into. Maybe this is like where the mayor lives, and so it's like a big mansion at the end of the street. Um, 
and, and so they can all get into it. Now here's here's like the marketplace. Yay! There's like stalls and uh, and you know everyone's having a, a, a grand old time uh, down here. Uh, and then uh, we had under purview of the uh, the the demon temple itself. Um, you know this is the old graveyard. Uh oh, the old graveyard is back this way. And you can make your players think, well, hang on. If they're sacrificing, you know, if they're sacrificing people, like, they're burying the bodies, like, respectfully or something? Um, or who's, you know, if they sacrifice people, why are there people who are left behind to get buried? That's a very good question. As a DM, do you know the answer? Or do you just put a graveyard and work it out as you will? So graveyard, uh, residential area here, uh, leading up. You know, you could a bunch of spooky houses. Uh, you can have a mini dungeon. Like you could almost treat this like the village of Barovia in Curse of Strahd, and you know, and this could be like uh, the death house or something like that. So here's our open air market. Uh, beyond this, we could have, um, you know, this could be a military training grounds uh, for the, you know, for the elite guards of the, uh, for the elite guards of the uh, of the cultists, because obviously people are gonna are gonna come back who are unhappy that their loved ones were kidnapped and sacrificed in the night, and so. And plus, this is also going to show that if they built a fort or a training area for these sort of martial practices, you know, of this monastery otherwise, um, it could give evidence into what they're going to be getting into later for combat skills of the cultists or the monks or whatever. Um, and it'll also show that these people were preparing for war. They were, the, the, this was deliberate. Who builds a fort if not uh, to defend yourself and teach yourself martial uh, techniques to uh, to attack and defend, and so this could play into that uh, that war with the Fey that uh, erupted after you know the Archfey finally said, "No, nah, I'm I'm done." Oh, Grace of Darkness! Thank you for the resubscription. Thank you, and thank you for being here, and thank you for believing in us. That's really kind of you. Enchant Enchanter Carrie is back again. Hello again. Oh, coffee! You posted Mordecai. Well, let's let's take a look at our blue boy. Come on, there we go. And by the way, uh, Coffee Cat also did some other works in progress for the Tuesday game. If you wanted to, to check out that art. And, oh, Fan, uh, Fano uh, put up another juggling video. Awesome stuff. I suggest you watch his videos. Like, it may not seem directly related to D&D &D or role-playing, but if you watch this, you can get a, some really cool ideas for characters. All right, let's see Mordecai painted up. Oh, I like the effect on the, on the spell there. And look at how gaudy those green boots are. <laughs> A nice little moon. Oh, look at that cape, too. And that tuft of blue at the end. Mordecai is as raucous as I would hope that he could ever be. Thank you for sharing that. In fact, not only a heart, we have a Mordecai emote also. There we go.
cape is crazy. I dig it. I wish I could paint worth a worth a good golly darn. All right, so anyway, we're, we're just putting shapes on the map here, right? We're telling a story, and in so doing, we're, we're providing our, ourselves with content. And we could even go, look, we're the DM, and so we know what's happening. We can come back and with, uh, we'll get a nice blue. All right, we know that uh, this house and this house and this house and this house and this house, these are all unoccupied. Like, they're ruined, uh, they're abandoned, or whatever. Um, and then we can even come back and say this wing of the mansion, like where the mayor of the cultist, of uh, you know, cultist town used to be, this wing is demolished, but you know, this one, this one's lived in over here. We can make a note to ourselves to say that this graveyard, which I guarantee you, your players are, are going to want to explore. Maybe there's some treasure, but maybe there's not, you know, we learn that there's no undead or maybe there are, you want to make that on your map. So go and go and make these notes. You know, maybe the market has had uh, evidence of uh, of scrounging or even evidence of people like trading or something along those lines. So here I'll, I'll make a little eyeball. Ooh, there's something to see here, everyone. Something to see. And then the fort. You know, you could go. Uh, you know, clues about the war or they they find something or they find something or another. So now we're focusing in on our dungeon. It has culture, it has character, it has history. We're, we're going up this road. Uh, the only road we've ever known. Like a drifter, you know, we were born to walk alone. Except this time we have some friends with us. And more ideas are coming to mind. We're becoming more comfortable with something we didn't even know existed 10, 15, 20 minutes ago, an hour ago. And if nothing else here is relevant, or we could type in notes in the margin, um, you know, of, you know, if you want to have an encounter table, you can. If you want to just say they run into someone and it's a scripted event, you can. This is up to you, but I want to convey that in the planning process, this is where you can make those notes, whether it's it's on the map itself. Because, look, you can recreate this really easily uh, if you need to that doesn't have... I mean, look, if you're using Photoshop and you have layers and all that other fancy stuff... Uh, more power to you. Um, I am an absolute scrub, and uh, and so I use MS Paint with the best of them. I mean, I, it would o I could only be worse if I was using a trackball mouse and MS Paint. <laughs> I didn't catch that offhand, but I'm glad that uh, I, I'm glad that there uh, that you put in that detail. And this will, again, this will give you, like, encounter table references or scripted event references. And you can say, all right, so uh, there's an obvious way in through this gate that apparently, you know, is part of a demon's mouth. And you have to enter in through the mouth. Who knew except us when we just made it up right now. But to get through without force or deception or manipulation, uh, you are going to need a special, a special key. And so here, uh, the person playing Fistus says, I think I have one. I have a medallion. And you say, you know what? It looks like a medallion does fit in there. Go ahead and give it a try. And, you know, she'll kind of uh, hobble up and boop, put the medallion in. And you can say, well, it, it looks like it's a close match, but it's not enough. So it looks like an, another one is needed in order to get into the uh, into this outer cloister area. Um, so in stating that, her pendant is relevant and is similar to other things that should be found. You didn't have to telegraph. I mean, you can. You can always telegraph to your players. But if you want to get them thinking and you want them to use their noodles, what we just did was uh, indicate what you need and generally what it looks like. And you did so without having to be ham-fisted about it. Maybe if they choose to pass through the gates, some ghastly visage of an ancient temple guardian appears before them, warning them not to release the dark powers within. I like that, but maybe they encounter that in the village first. 
Because whatever's going on here, even the old guard ghosts probably have been evicted. All right, the the demons back with a vengeance, and so and so maybe a couple of these houses, uh, whether they're haunt, whether we cross them out from living people or not, uh, maybe they can encounter uh, a, a a cult ghost who now is telling them, "You thought we were bad, uh, you know, eleven billion years ago. You haven't seen the sick puppies that have moved in there." You know, if you want to know what they're doing, all you got to do is listen, like, cup your ear, and on a still night, you're going to hear the sound of, uh, you know, simultaneously someone crunching into a fresh ripe apple and and uh, plunging their fist into a five-gallon uh, thing of mayonnaise. And the ghost can't even fathom what that is. And, um, and, and so uh, here in the village, you're building, you're building tension, and you can build an expectation of what's to come. What are you looking for? What could exist inside? Because this this outer approach is... Um, this outer approach is... Um, clues? Maybe an encounter. I mean, maybe nothing rough physically, but it could be the encounter with the ghost. You said, <laughs> do not go in there. Um, or Or other things like that. And so you could be really subtle about it and it still comes off, you know, it's very natural and you convey the point in character because you can always just ham fist, tell them, uh, your pendant looks like it works, but you need one with three triangles instead of two, uh, because there are three triangles here. Oh, oh, oh okay. I, I don't know how I put that together, but thank you for the information. <laughs> the, the very, my, my brain in character is apparently very blunt. Uh, and it has had enough of my uh, enough of my stalling. And so this is very much a part of your dungeon, right? There could be traps left behind, uh, or hazards, right? A, a house can collapse on one of the players because they went rooting through other people's stuff, and it's just the how things went. Or there could be a cultist or uh, someone or something, an animal. Right? Animals could very well have taken up uh, shelter inside these houses and such. You know, bugs or mammals or whatever. Some burbs. And you know burbs can be real jerks. Now that they have uh, pieced together what happens here, we can move to the ins to, to this, this outer cloister. And now things are a little bit more serious. They can probably encounter cultists. Um, you know, sneaking is probably going to be the preferred method but can they keep it up or as the alternative path suggestion goes um if they is there another way in that doesn't involve taking the front door because apparently no other roads approach here and if you say something like uh every animal within i don't know there's a pile of animal corpses uh, mostly like birds and uh, uh, birds and such, uh, you know, that are f five to ten feet outside of the exterior of the wall, with the exception of a little uh, knot area of death flanking the path up. Y you're giving off the idea that, okay, so animals that approach seemingly just die. And then your players might say, wait a minute. So we could we could find the key. In fact, you know what? Fistus probably just has the key to the inner cloister herself. Or if you wanted to put in one step, say, well, the pendant always had a, a thing in the middle, and it looks like you might need, a, I don't know, a gemstone or a piece of metal, or um, it has a little divot that has to be filled with blood, but you don't know that until you find a clue in a cultist diary here in the dormitory, um, something along those lines. Um, and then she can, you know, make the little, like the little blood sacrifice to gain entry into the inner cloister or they'll notice. All right. So this thing kills animals, but look at this. There's plants that are growing like into and out of this area. It's kind of sealed almost like it's merged, but, but how can we use that to our advantage? And then they could say, well, maybe we can move through plants and we'll just sort of like move through the, the tree roots and plop inside. Uh, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can convince the plants to, uh, coat us, you know, like we'll wear moss around ourselves 
like a, a living ghillie suit. And maybe that will let us pass or get close for an alternative entry because we're surrounded in kind of an aura of moss. And maybe that's all it checks is what's on the outside, even though we all know it's what's on the inside that counts. Um, or maybe they say, oh, well, so if the tree's kind of growing in and out of the wall, if we just burn the tree down or cut it or something, then a hole is going to be left behind. And you as a DM say, a hole would be left behind, wouldn't it? And then they'll spend their time, they'll climb up a big tree, you know, cut down the branch, like carve out or, you know, use magic to hollow out um, a, a limb that was growing into this Im otherwise impenetrable uh, killing field. And, uh, and now they have a tunnel inside, despite them being animals themselves. Alternate paths. And all of this is building lore. All of this is building tension. Because um, especially if they, if they if do have to fight a cultist, or they do have to fight off uh, turned wildlife, or uh, just uh, hazards that occur in an area like this. And so now we've ramped things up, right? It's a little harder. Uh, Got to get a couple clues together, uh, piece together what you want to do. And then finally, we are in the Inner Sanctum. Now, the this Inner Sanctum is probably something we can map in more detail. And uh, I, I, I think I'll do so on Wednesday, right? I mean, because it's Saturday. I don't normally broadcast Sunday or uh, Sunday or Monday nights. If I do, it's like a bonus stream, and I'll, I'll let you know in Discord. But I think we can do a more detailed look at the Inner Temple. And we can do that on Wednesday after the... Uh, after the D&D game on Tuesday and after we do our raffle giveaway on Wednesday. And now, look look between the, the pieces we've created. We have a large map. It has culture. It has economy. It has history. And now, we're, we've zoomed in to just this little region. And then on this, we can zoom in more. <laughs> enhance. 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 Um... And so now we're getting we're getting closer and we're becoming more focused, um, more deadly, more clues to put together, more puzzles to solve, more encounters, and the encounters are probably going to get more difficult the closer to here you get. And for very obvious reasons, you're approaching the epicenter of the corruption. Uh, you're approaching the very area where the demon is being summoned in, you know, bit by bit, or uh, however you, you're you want to describe it when it when they see it. I mean, you could make it like all big and slimy and gross like Doom. Uh, you could make it something like an elegant devil ritual, uh, you know, a devil summoning ritual where, you know, there's these arcane kind of foul marks on the floor, but a very stately uh, man or woman is being summoned in who's dressed impeccably. And through this storytelling method, our dungeon isn't just the, the corridors of the inner sanctum, which even myself, you know, you, you we, 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 bah. Do I speak common? We jump to it, right? When we hear dungeon, we have a preconceived notion. All of this is dungeon. In fact, I could go to the other map and say that, really, that's just a large outdoor dungeon. You know, we're not leaving the region, and you have to use the knowledge and the resources that are available to you where you're at currently. This dungeon, though, does get narrower and narrower over time until now you're just worried about, like, a small town... Uh, a small town's worth of uh, houses, you know, a graveyard. Uh, hey, diadems. Uh, and then finally that gets smaller because now instead of talking about a, a whole small town population, there might be a uh, hundred cultists that live here. Or more or less. And then you, uh, all of this is, is giving you a glimpse of the lifestyle of the people who live here. And therefore, you're getting clues about this demon, about uh, about how it, uh, what it prefers, how it acts, uh, the words that are used, the way that you should address it, or um, or bow to it, or whatever, <laughs> if you want to do that yourself. Um, and so we go from you know region to area to town to outer cloister, and now we get to the inner cloister, and there might just be you know the almost completely brought back remains of the demon and the top 10 priests of this cult. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have animals or they don't have flesh golems or something along those lines. But I'm talking about just the, the living inhabitants. And here, we can really micromanage because now you don't have to run 
you know, a couple city blocks to go get something from a store and then go blah, blah, blah. Now you're in a very traditional dungeon setting where you're going into a sealed building. Who knows what's going to happen or where to go? And you just push on. And all the while, because you have made this from scratch, even if you have random inserts of, uh, of some dice rolls compared to the tables that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide, because there's... The Dungeon Master's Guide has an excellent dungeon building section. I would recommend that you read it, get used to it, enjoy it. Even if you don't do it, at least be familiar with it. But going outside of even that and just telling the story of who did what, when, where, why, and how. You've offered so much to this tale that you're telling with your with your players. I hope that makes sense, DMs. Welcome back. We mostly Maddie, uh, but a lot of us helped a bit. Created a cool little demon temple adventure. Yeah, and uh, I think on Wednesday we'll just we'll focus on designing the inner temple specifically, since we're now at the point in our story where it'll be important to know the ins, the outs. You know, generally, uh, generally the concept of the rooms. Um, you know, I. I don't know. Did they build extraneous rooms that have no use? Or were these cultists, yes, they were worshipping a devil or a demon, but they realized, come on, like, not everything, like, who installs a toilet on the ceiling? Come on, guys. And I'll tell you what, though, if you enter a bathroom and the toilet's installed on the ceiling and the water's still in it, or even if it's not, you just, something, something's going on. <laughs> Be very careful. I have jalapeno popper flavored Doritos. These are fantastic. Oh, I had some uh, some jalapeno and bacon chicken bites earlier. So I appreciate your your love of spice. All right, Maddie, with DMs back, I practically have to just crack one last box. I think. Oh, DMs, man, are, you're forcing Flump's tentacle here, aren't you? Trust a Flump is DMs bullying you. Come on, you can be honest. Well then, which box would you like to crack? Uh, we still have eight boxes uh, from the just recently unsealed brick of Dragon Heist. Or I have four boxes or half my brick remaining of Storm King's Thunder. He's really twisting my tentacle. <laughs> uh, Derek, you say I'm so jealous right now. What are you jealous about, Derek? Oh, so <laughs> uh, be be a good boy then, Derek. Don't let the don't let the big old mean flump uh, get you otherwise. Storm King's Thunder of Wonder Darius. All right, let's see what's in this Storm King. Going for a first dib pull, so I'll be revealing four figures and trust a flump. Uh, we'll get to waggle a, uh, a noodly appendage at one and uh, say, that one, that one there, it pleases me. Watch Flump will pop, will pop Harshnag. Oh, Derek, I think you went to bed. I had one box of Tomb of Annihilation left last night. Actually, it's probably better if uh, Trusta Flump tells that story while I'm going over, uh, or Diadems uh, tells the story. Bit Bucket Demo, thank you for the follow. I hope you're enjoying yourself. Welcome. But I'll let them tell the tale of what happened with my very last box of Tomb of Annihilation. He's a lucker. <laughs> Alrighty, Mr. Flump. You have a Kazi Alephandra. 
and check out that the great bow on on this character. Hoo wee! Not even a long bow, but a great bow. Next up, we have a Yoch lol. I actually kind of like what the green screen effect is doing to it, especially with that intense eye. But yes, here's a Yoch lol. We move into the uncommons. And you have a Thrykreen with a Kachka. That's their custom three-bladed, kind of like a chakra or a boomerang. Flump makes elaborate tentacle wiggles, including strange flumpy sounds, to explain the story of how I bought a bazillion boxes of TOA, and then each time the moment I stopped buying, I called it quits, the next box had an Acerarak. Derek, Acerarak was the one figure that Flump wanted the most in his flumpy little heart. And on my la yeah, on the last box, he was hemming and hawing. He's like, I don't know. Should I DM? Should I get this last box? And Diadems is like, Yeah, you totally should. And uh and then uh Flump is like, eh, I'm gonna pass. And so then Diadems uh swoops in and picks up the box, and wouldn't you know it, a Sararak is inside that box. Yeah, and it happened the day before with Plunder Loot's a Sararak too. It's uncanny. So every time you don't want to buy a box, Flump, it's going to have the figure. <laughs> it's going to have the figure you want. Now, speaking of figures, the last figure in this box is a Fire Giantess with a mace. A Fire Giantess with a mace. And we'll put a mere human next to her for scale. Which piece would you like, my dear Flumph? She's hot, says Derek. <laughs> Literally dies wiggling. <laughs> The giant test, please, and thank you. Once more, the sig, the the flump signature. And a giant test for the flump. And orphans for the pile. All right. I have three boxes of Storm King's Thunder remaining. Flump's got a thing for chonking ladies and gentlemen. What can I say? That's right. Because there's just more of them to love meaning there's more delicious thoughts to eat out of their brains. Might have to do a first dibs on an SKT to get me a harsh nag? Well, it's up to you. I certainly appreciate all that you've done to, to support. And if you want one, you know, you can come to me and I'll, I'll, I'll pull something for you. <laughs> 